We'll start. Um, this is a panel discussion we're going to have on the District Comics and Unconventional History of Washington, D.C. And it's a, a comics anthology uh, featuring historical stories about Washington, D.C., but they're all kind of offbeat a little bit or told in a unique uh, narrative. And so um, we've got some of the contributors here, uh, artists and writers and writer artists. Um, and uh, directly to my left is Kevin Chepesky. 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 And he worked with uh, Chad Lambert, who's uh, at the end of the table on, uh, on the story that they'll, uh, they'll talk about. And then uh, Jacob Warnfeld uh, was one of the illustrators um, on, the, on the story. And Rafa Roberts was an uh, illustrator slash co-writer on another story. And then there's uh, Tom Williams, who uh, illustrated one of the stories. So um, the way we kind of did this project was it covers a vast span of the history of Washington, C, Washington D.C. from its kind of founding um, to its uh, current, current uh, state. So we had a story, for example, the first story was about um, the first newspaper in Washington, D.C., and how that kind of came about before the city was even a city yet. And the last story, the most contemporary story we had was um, about the uh, first inauguration of President Obama. Um, but that story was told from the perspective of uh, a DC police officer who designed the inauguration badges for the, uh, you know, for the, uh, for the event. And so um, we kind of told it from his point of view. And so we interviewed him and you know, they gave us a, a lot of reference material. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how we came up with our story ideas, uh, what we, how we researched them maybe, and you know what we use as references because we try to make this as, as historically accurate as possible, but also fun in a way. So um, uh, I'd like to uh, start with uh, with Chad. Uh, maybe you can talk about your story, uh, urban legend that you worked on with Kevin. Okay. How, how did you come up with the idea? What was it that you thought that, that would make a good connection to this book? It was interesting because um, you know Matt had contacted me about possibly doing a story. Two days before, I, I told my wife, I said, hey, I'm really getting tired of making up crap. It'd be nice to, to do some, some biographical work. I was kind of itching to do that. So uh, Matt had contacted me about this, this project, and uh, you know, it was literally like, I couldn't, no idea came to mind. So I literally Googled interesting stories about Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> because I was just trying to get the, the, the juices flowing. I, I was just trying to come up with something. And the first thing I landed on was this story about Benjamin Banneker, uh, who was a free black man present at the birth of D.C. As Washington, D.C. was being designed and, and laid out. Um, and there was this, this weird myth that he may or may not have like committed the plans to memory, that he had a photographic memory. So for some reason, this didn't strike me as an interesting story. So I kept telling Matt, I'm like, well, I got this one, but I'd really rather find another one. So I spent all this time researching, and, and like the, the the elephant in the room was there the whole time. That I just it was so obvious that this was the story I was going to write. And what was so funny was like while I was trying to find other stories, I was picking up research on this because it was, just became sort of a, a personal interest story. So while I'm researching the story of Benjamin Banneker, I'm still trying to come up with a better idea for the book. That's, which was ridiculous. And it just came down to like, Matt's like, why don't you do the, do the panic repeat? He's like, you've already got it in your head. So um, I did quite a bit of research online. Um, I had a couple of books, but I just couldn't put, I couldn't put this together visually in my mind until I came across this book, which I brought with me, which was uh, The Man Who Saved Washington, which was a biography created for like fifth graders, which of course struck me as fascinating. Um, but it was written by, you know, three doctorates of black history, and they, they put the story together of, like, the actual, um, the actual myth versus reality of, of did he commit these plans to memory, and did he have a photographic memory. So it, it was a biography of, of his life with tendencies toward photographic memory. So it just struck me as just a fascinating story. That's how it, that's how it kind of, it was done before I realized I wanted to do it. <laughs> Yeah, Kevin, maybe you talk about how did you how did you take uh, Chad's script and, and kind of visualize it? Um, I guess, at least from my perspective, I felt like I just kind of took it pretty faithfully from 
what it gave me, you know. Um, I guess there may have been some sort of like, I don't know, personal spin I put on it, but from the way I was thinking about it, it's like, read the script, it's like, okay, this is how it needs to be. Um, I guess the main thing was, uh, at the time I had started doing this um, kind of painting technique on like a drafting film, so I think I was like, oh, I definitely want to do that with this project, so ended up working with that. And, um, I don't know, it was, I had a good time. Um, it sort of worked out. I had been wanting to uh, take a trip back to DC, so when I got the script from Chad, it's like, okay, well, how about I go to the, this location where he's talking about it and take a bunch of reference photos? So it's kind of like I have a, more of a purpose for actually going on this trip. Because the way it's set up, it's sort of uh, bookended by a, um, a contemporary setting, and a, a dad is picking up his son from school and then uh, the son's talking about how they learned about Benjamin Banneker and so I I found where this school was because Chad like pointed out a very specific school so I went there and I sort of started at the school and sort of traced a path you know however they would have walked home I sort of took pictures along the way so it was real kind of neat to be able to use all those photos as I was sort of putting together you know what's that they passed by that one, um, I can't remember what exactly what it is. Do you remember? I remember. No. <laughs> if you have a chance, we actually have some of the original art on display behind uh, table 111. And so you can actually see the, the, that kind of filmy paper that uh, Kevin worked on. And he uh, painted acrylics, right? It's double acrylics. Yeah. So. And, um, uh, but, um, they got to pass by a really interesting monument, which I think had, uh, you know, another tie to African American history. So I think that was like a, a nice kind of uh, synchronistic moment. It was like, oh, that's really nice. And um, and then aside from that, you know, it was pretty cool hitting hitting up the library, and uh, you know, I got this huge book all about kind of like detailing pretty much like every item that's in Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home, just so I could get a sense of, you know, like what kind of like stage dressing would be there around that period. So it was, I also kind of needed to dig into like the kids reference material to like really find, you know, like good visual information because, you know, I guess they don't have these kind of like big photographic references that they may have used to. Right. And it was funny, you mentioned the, the framing sequence. I uh, had originally written it straight to where there was a setup and it, it went right through it. It just seemed a little dry, like I wasn't connecting with the material. And um, that month, by total absolute coincidence, my son, who was at the time in second grade, uh, got Benjamin Banneker for his uh, Black History Month assignment. And it was funny because like I was very excited about this. I'm like, I'm writing about Benjamin Banneker too. And he could have cared less. Like, he was, <laughs> so this conversation home became the conversation in the book yeah. of don't you understand? He was a, a free black man at the birth of DC. You know, we play video games when you home. And it's just, it's just the kid had absolutely no interest in it. I'm like, that's how I get in and get out. That, that's how I how I make it relevant to the times and, yeah. and you know, and put like you said, put those synchronous things in there. Of you know that this this has such a meaning to Black history and it's such a forgotten story that I wanted to kind of subtly build that without it being preachy. Yeah, I thought that was really a really nice touch in the script and really did make it really weighty, you know, in that subtle way. So you know, you're walking by, um, you know, it's not a super, you know, it's a pretty it's a nice area, but you know, it's definitely not you know the nicest place you can find in DC. And so it's kind of, you know, he had moments in the script where they're just walking by, seeing people on the streets, you know, you get a chance to really take a look at what's going on and you like, you know, you kind of sink in like how much has gone on in between, you know, the start of the city and now. Um, just uh, talking about Lori with Tom, Tom illustrated uh, one of the more contemporary stories we have in the book. We did a story about uh, Pump bad, uh, bad brains, and um, 
you know, at the time, and it's a story that I wrote and Tom illustrated. Um, but we, um, again, there's a lot of research involved. We talked to a lot of folks that were around. We actually, I talked to the guys in the band. We talked to a lot of the folks that were around during that time, like Ian McKay, who's a producer of Discord Records, and Fugazi. He actually provided quite a few photos. Uh, his brother just did photos, and he provided some of the photo references that were never published in any books or anything, and uh -huh. let us uh, use that, particularly when they're playing kind of in the DC ghetto. Yeah. And um, so maybe you talk a little bit about uh, the reference material and how you use it in your story. Okay. Well, what, what Ian provided was very helpful. Um, I, I'm kind of music obsessed, so I, I love Discord, the label, and so I have like some reference already. Um, especially like there was a shot of the Teen Idols um, in there, so I used that as reference in the story. Um, there were it was like two or three documentaries on punk and hard, the hardcore scene, and so just to get uh, well, I'm not really a stranger to the mosh pit, um, just to get that kind of rhythm and energy going in a lot of the like the crowd shots was very helpful. Um, and I thought your, your, your style really fit really well with that story. Has, yeah. Like you said, it has that kind of energy, that vibrancy, or just almost out of control, but not quite. It's just yeah. being barely contained. Right. And I thought it really kind of came through it. And, you know, again, folks, uh, Tom has let us post some of his uh, pages up uh, behind table 111. Let's so kind of take a look at that. What was, uh, for you, what, was, what do you think was the most challenging thing to illustrate in that? Um, I to get. I was kind of, you know, attentive on what the uh, the musical equipment looked like. Like I, I kept trying to find a decent picture of like what the the guitar looked like okay. from that era. And it was always like a grainy shot of like a VHS. Like, it's been like dubbed a couple of times, so it's really blurry. Um, and I also used, well, just aesthetically, I Xerox a lot of textures just like moving my hand and stuff, just to kind of mimic those uh, flyers you would see, and you know, I incorporated that into the look of the piece. Um, and what, uh, what was your favorite part to do, to draw? Um, well, the, the lead singer has such an expressive face, so it was really fun to draw. Yeah, yeah, I thought, uh, yeah, you know what I really, really like? The fact he's got that little gap in his tooth. Yeah, and yeah. He's got to capture it really well in a lot of the, uh, lot of the panels. You know, that's him. Yeah. Um, just uh, switching here a little bit to, to Rafa Roberts, who um, <coughs> wrote a story about uh, Truman. Mm -hmm. uh, it's true, it's true. <laughs> just Truman. Just yeah. Truman. And um, we had uh, uh, this, this, this other guy in DC, Art Hout, who was a co-writer co in that story. And, uh, Rafe was going to illustrate it, and then we kind of had some problems just reining it in a little bit. So kind of Rafe kind of came in and, and helped to uh, put some parameters on it, just focus what we wanted to do. Yeah, well, what Art did really well is he researched the living hell out of the story. He had all these original, uh, the story is about the attempted assassination on uh, Harry S. Truman, um, and the background of it was he was getting ready to go uh, to a dedication at Arlington. So all these newspaper reporters are gonna meet him at um, the place he was staying because the White House was under construction. So it's like the, the same as like, it was the most well-covered presidential assassination ever because all these news uh, reporters were there. So there was so much material and direct quotes from everybody going there and it was just fascinating. Like, most of the dialogue is straight from the newspaper reports. Um, so there was all this research just trying to wrangle it in to an eight-page story. Yeah, just, um, so we did it sort of, kind of the concept of the whole book is it's, it's DC history from a common man's perspective. Yeah, it was so, someone, you had someone, t usually right. someone telling a story in right. some, some way. So I had taken just one of uh, his reporters, like a young uh, cub photographer who uh, was very Jimmy Olsen looking. Uh, basically just covering it, uh, taking pictures wherever you can, and then uh, snippets of the witnesses in the background. And knowing that it was a children's book and it's basically just eight pages of a gunfight and people getting killed, <laughs> like, all right, well, I, I'm going to tone this down as best I can. 
uh, bodies will be laying partially in the shadows, and just to see their feet. Um, no big explosions of blood or anything. Just people going, ow, you shot me. I'm not sure he's added up Django Unchained. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I think one of the things in this book is just like, as you mentioned, the anthology, you can't necessarily write a 25, 30, 40 page story, you know? You have to be really selective. Kind of sharp on your, on your editing, what to include, to kind of convey your message effectively and efficiently. But we had that in a couple other stories. That was like one of the reasons I, I kind of asked for your know, assistance on that was, you know, I think, like you said, Mark, having raw material is there, but you know, with your experience working on your books, how do we kind of sculpt it? Uh, we had that with um, one of the stories we had here was about uh, a CIA agent who was accused of being a spy. And um, so we, we caught, this was like in, the, uh, in the early 1990s. It was between him and this, the FBI was researching, they were figuring it was between this guy and someone else. Couldn't figure out which one it was. So they thought it was this, this guy, Brian Kelly. And so um, we went and we, uh, interviewed Brian Kelly um, and uh, Peter Conrad illustrated the story. And so again, but Pete, you know, for, for a CIA guy, this guy talked a lot. You know, he had, you know, I think he, he was working on his uh, autobiography at the time, and he just had just a ton of material. He was, you know, uh, talking about all these different angles, but we had to kind of really focus it on one thing. So it was really about when they came in, they, they, they tapped his house, and, you know, they would be running him through the mill. Like, they would go to his, like his mother, who was ill, they would go to the hospital and say, so how's it feel now your, your son's a uh, you know, Russian spy? You know, and stuff like that. Um, so I think he narrowed that story down, but you know, unfortunately, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Brian passed away uh, before the book came out. And that was like one of those stories where you have to kind of really rein it in, you know. Um, Jake, when you talk about the story you worked on with uh, with uh, Jeff Barrett, yeah. and uh, there's a little bit of background. Um, I think the way it kind of originated was the, um, every year in D.C. we have a big motorcycle rally called um, Rolling Thunder. It's mostly um, uh, war Viet veterans. It's it's Vietnam veterans. Mostly, yeah, mostly Vietnam veterans, but there's a lot more of the more contemporary era veterans as well to join Sing in. Sing Lumber Sing Lumber Desert Smart veterans. Yeah, like that yeah absolutely. Yeah. So that was kind of the basis for that story. So maybe you could talk about, you know, um, what was the process working with Jeff? Did he just kind of or kind of just write it and give you the script, or did you just collaborate? How that worked? Well, it worked. It actually worked out really well. Uh, Jeff, Jeff and I worked. Um, uh, on, on a couple of projects together before, uh, and he's a really detail-specific writer. Like I get a lot of scripts like from different uh, different writers, like people like when you did a uh, trickster. Like I just got like a two-page short story. It's like, hey, can you convert this into an eight-page comic? Um, Jeff's was very specific. Every panel was laid out. Like this is where the camera angles from. This is the kind of motorcycle this guy's riding. It was very very specific. So, you know. Sometimes that feels a little stifling, you know, you feel like you don't really get to express, uh, your, you know, yourself that much. But uh, in this case, it was really, really easy. It made, it made the process simple. And then I could focus on things that, uh, uh, like, work into the story. Like, uh, it was a color piece. And, like, I don't do a whole lot of color work. Uh, most of my stuff's all black and white. So if you look at my stuff in district comics, it's, um, it's, uh, it's told through flashbacks. So all the foreground, all the, uh, the present day scenes are blue, and all the flashback sequences are military era from Vietnam. Uh, I did it in green. So that was pretty nice. Can you can just tell us a little bit about the stories about? Oh, sure. Um, the, yeah, so every year around Memorial Day in, in D.C., there's a motorcycle rally called the uh, Iron Thunder, where uh, 250,000 motorcyclists ride from the Pentagon to the uh, Vietnam Memorial. So I ride a motorcycle, and uh, I'm the resident motorcycle artist in uh, DC conspiracy. <laughs> so uh, when Kim uh, Matt approached me about doing this, it was a couple months before that event. So I went and signed up, and I rode in it with, uh, with a bunch of, with a bunch of other veterans. It was great. I got to meet Sarah Palin. It was a uh, it was a uh, it was a fun day. You guys were riding four miles an hour for like three hours. It was really, it was, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Um, uh, yeah. Was you started? Did you? Uh, where did you start your ride from? From from the, in Fairfax or from the Pentagon? From the Pentagon. Yeah, yeah. It's I guess that's the 
Yeah. You're right. I guess it comes it comes all the way from the west. <laughs> Some guys ride out from like Mount or I guess further west. Yeah, they all come in from various locations. They meet at certain points and they kind yeah. of go and they kind of also get there. Yeah, and yeah, all the stages of the parking lot. Right. Right. How'd you like driving motorcycles? That's fun. I I, I love <laughs> motorcycles. Uh, um, I pretty much stick motorcycles into just about everything in the world. So. Uh, but I guess when you have one, you can run outside for a reference real quick. You know, you know, um, you know one thing we were, I was talking with Chad uh, earlier today about, you know, kind of what people have liked about this book. You know, I know you guys had, um, well, a couple of you had, had good shows and kind of, you know, exhibited the book and you sold the book and, you know, um, as have I. And I, I think so far the, direct, the, direct, the feedback's been pretty good, you know, because I think, of, you know, I think there's a, there's this desire for more different types of comics, you know, so just, uh, if you talk about superheroes or even like alternative stuff, there's a lot of ways you can use comics to, to tell history, but tell it in a unique way, you know what I mean? Um, and so what do you guys think about doing some stories like that, you know, more the uh, folks that you talk to? Um, well, I, I, for me, doing a, a style is uh, what a lot more realistic than my normal style, which is usually all over the place and weird. Uh, um, was it I, easier challenging to do it that way? It was difficult for me because um, I like Kevin. I, I took a lot of pictures and did a lot of photo reference, uh, which is uh, it was good because I, I got to um, draw more realistic. Uh, landscapes and, and backgrounds and make it historically accurate. But since it's not something that's like my normal process, it was a little difficult for a while and it's actually what led to the magic bullet cover that I did coming out of it because it was like ah, with all the wires coming out of the guy's head. It's like, it's, um, but it was good. I think it's improved my drawing since then. Uh, doing stuff like that, making it a little bit more grounded in reality. As far as reaction, I mean, people really seem to like it. Yeah. It's being sold. Uh, they show there's like Smithsonian bookstore yeah. carrying it. Well, it was interesting because uh, uh, one of the one of the ideas behind it was it was uh, a rather regional book. You know, it's not. It's part of the, part of the thing we're aiming for was to present a story that was about a, a, a kind of a big city, but beyond the politics of it. Even though there are political stories in it. Even when we have a story about the president, it's really about the police officer right. and his kind of involvement in it, how he designed the badge and stuff like that. It's not so much about you know, Obama um, that we can you know, explore that. So these are people who live in the city, you know, and, and I think we also have the, have the advantage that it's the nation's capital. So you're going to have, I think, a broader interest than maybe if you did you know, other types of cities. But again, you know, I think that's kind of uh, kind of played into the into the favor of, of the book. Um, you know, one thing I want to ask the artists here is, like, did you guys do anything, anything stylistically in the way you illustrated? Um, Ray for kind of mentioned that it wasn't typically the way he would draw the kind of style he uses. I think it turned out well. It's just it yeah. was a different process. Yeah. Kevin, did you do something different that you don't do? You um, mentioned painting. Is yeah. That, that was unusual? Um, that's kind of, uh, I had done it on one or two projects around that time, and so I was excited about doing it. I remember when I started, I. I think I drew it like one or two times at first and I was, because of the subject matter, it just really, I was like trying to push myself to like be like as, you know, naturalistic in the figures as possible and I was just kind of, every time it came out it was a, a long struggle and I was just never happy with the result and I needed to sort of like take myself aside and be like, you know, just like do this like you do anything and sort of like making it you know, leaning it a little bit more towards the cartoony end of the spectrum, which sort of like allowed me to actually like get through it and make it all work. So um, I think that, because um, I think that actually kind of like helped in the future sort of like go between projects because um, I think I would, especially like a couple years ago when I was drawing this, I was doing kind of like a lot of like different styles, like each project was kind of like bounce around and it's sort of in that mindset that everything needed to be really different, but like sort of be able to sort of like 
stick to sort of my strengths, which were actually more versatile than I think I was imagining they were, kind of like put me in a good place. So. You know, when I was doing, uh, I illustrated one of the stories, it was about uh, a shoeshine guy. And I kind of struggled that way as well. Like, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it like real, like realistic, like photorealistic or something more cartoony. So I think I drew this story, in addition to like the uh, thumbnails, I think I drew it like five times. You know, yeah, and then, like, and then I would try, and then I had the complication of like, well, how I do the colors. Did I want to do it like, you know, electronically or watercolor or something else, you know? So I found it really, that was a particular challenge that I don't think I've ever run into before. You know, I think I finally found my comfort zone, but it took me uh, like a while. Tom, did you, how, how, did you have any of those struggles or? Um, well, I always kind of strayed away from doing likenesses. And uh, it's right around the time I got asked to do that. And I got inundated with likenesses from different people like me. Great. <laughs> um, but uh, it really helps that uh, a lot of the people in the story had very unique faces. That they look more like pretty or perfect, it's hard to really caricature that. Like like you know, Leonardo DiCaprio or Brad Pitt or something like that. I can never make it look like that. It's still look like a generic model type. Very it really helped with it. Very unique. How did you do the the coloring aspect? Um, well, the textures. Did you do a lot of textures. In this yeah, I because of the the scene and subject matter. Um, I went back and I looked through a bunch of like flyers from from the day, and I tried to do a lot of like day glow patterns to mimic like, the paper. Scanned in a bunch of Xerox textures and sampled that so sort of like that. Old school show flyer. As the story progressed, I got away from it. What's going to be present? Jake, what about you? What was um, kind of challenging? Yeah. Or did you find anything to do with challenging? Well, I mean, there was just a lot of challenging stuff. I, I decided that um, when I got Jeff's script, that like, since uh, I wanted to go ride the event and like go participate in it, and uh, I didn't want to go find. Uh, map pictures of the round or try to like make everything look photogenic that I wasn't going to use any photo references. Um, Jeff was so specific, like, you know, Soldier A walks out of a helicopter with an M16 drawing over his shoulder or whatever. And just made like the machine gun. Like, and it started like just generalizing everything. Because you don't need, I don't know, I felt like I didn't need like a, a, a there's a helicopter in a couple of scenes. I didn't need like a specific Vietnam era helicopter. I've seen MASH, you know, that's in Korea. I can kind of, you know, like make it work and everything's green so it looks like Vietnam. Yeah, that, that was, uh, that, I guess that was my, that's how I approached it. I just decided like I'll just split the art be the art and just generalize it. I think, you know, uh, we talk yeah. about the color. We, we, we had a, well, the color like you, I, I have a, Couple of my coloring style, I tend to go um, this fake 1950s kind of old school coloring. I was going to do that originally, and I got two pages in. I was like, no, this sucks. Don't like that. And I try to do it all like a like a sepia tone, yeah. and like an old newsreel. It's like I can't, I can't even pull this off. So I was like three or four different attempts. Like ah, screw it. I'm, I'm going to get somebody else to color this. So uh, I found a uh, friend Wendy who came in and colored the thing and. I think it turned out really very nice and the best part is it looked very pretty and I didn't have to do it. So it was like, I think I, I maybe just like got so far into my own head on this book because um, Trickster had come out before and that was a very successful book so I mean, District Comics has come out the same thing and my head's like this is a very important book I thought I'd do a very good job on this and I was it was just I was just getting so far into this and I, but I, in the end, I was like, yeah, I think it turned out really well. Um, and I like hearing that everybody up there, you guys were struggling too, because that makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the, you know, like some of the, I brought some of the, the art that I did for it. And you know, I, what I did, what I ended up doing at the end was like, I just had uh, several pages, and then 
when I did like the gray wash, a little gray wash on it, and then the colors over it. And so I, I kind of just brought it to show folks that it was just kind of a lot of mix and match and stuff, and it's not this one piece of perfect artwork the way it's done and everything is, you know, it's gray washed and colored and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's kind of like just putting it all there and different pieces together. So, you know, that's you know, kind of interesting. Chad, maybe you could talk uh, about, uh, do you remember what other stories you were thinking about at the time? You know, I can't, I was thinking about that before I came in here, and there were three or four of them floating around. Yeah. I think they wound up in the book. I think you were kind of uh, pitching things I could have done. I think, did you pitch a Civil War one to you? I pitched a Civil War, I think I may have pitched something about Sousa at some point. Okay, yeah. But I mean, I just, everything was just dancing around this obvious one that I was going to do. And I couldn't, couldn't right. come in. And that's, that's, you know, as, as I edited this book, and, you know, my job is pretty much just to kind of manage and, you know, make sure that everything was kind of flowing. But I, the one thing we, that I wanted to make sure is that we didn't have too many stories of one kind of story. You know, for example, uh, the way I asked each uh, writer to maybe pitch two or three ideas, and then we'll walk, we'll walk through there, because I had like like about five people pitch a Civil War story. And so we obviously can't have district colleagues and have five Civil War stories in it. So we kind of pared it down a little bit that way. Um, but that was, uh, that was kind of uh, interesting as well in, in terms of uh, musician part of thing, you know. So I was definitely looking for different elements. You know, I wanted like a musical element, um, but I thought like having the contemporary uh, punk thing was a little bit of a different take on it. And again, we included some of the neighborhood scenes in it from uh, Anacostia, which is kind of a, a run down low income area in Washington. And, and these guys, I remember when I was talking to uh, to Ian and Dr. No from the band. They were telling me they would show. They showed up. This is the projects. They showed up projects, right? And this was like in '79 or something like that, yeah. with like an amp. And they would run the amp from someone's kitchen through the window, right in the courtyard. And they would play right there, and people were just like staring out the window, going, "What the hell is this?" You know, because it wasn't like it was like you know white punk music sort of thing. I mean, it wasn't really like considered you know kind of black music. But it was a black band playing this, and I don't know. That was just. It's pretty awesome in terms of like, you know, they really kind of turned out that the punk scene and it really influenced a lot of musicians in Washington. So, um, uh, Rayford, I want to go back to Truman. Okay. So, um, <laughs> what type of references did you use for your material? Um, like when I went down to DC, I probably benefit a little bit more. I live uh, about an hour outside the city. Um, went down and it's killing it because I'm liking the name of it the house where he was staying. But um, it's still there. Um, the White House was under construction, so Truman was staying at this uh, house across the street. Um, it's now probably got a museum and everything inside. Um, and I just stood out there and took pictures from every conceivable angle that I could, uh, standing back and uh, getting closer and then going like, across the street and then doing like panoramic to see where the White House was in relation to this thing and um, like what the buildings in the background looked like. I was like just going way, I probably took like two or three hundred pictures, used six of them. Um, uh, then because I know, I noticed like the street lights were a little bit more modernized and I went back and trying to see what the street lights in 1950s Washington DC would look like. Um, police uniforms, I was trying to get absolutely right. Um, there's a military guy who comes in a little bit later, so I was trying to research um, what the insignias on his uniform would look like. Like I was, I was going pretty uh, hardcore in some of this research. A lot. I'm not entirely sure I got that guy's uniform 100% correct, and it's killing me. Uh, but he was part of like, uh, Signal Corps, which uh, I couldn't quite find it, but I think it's got like two flags. And he was like on his, um, he's actually my, my favorite character in it. Because um, he was just a military guy walking down the street, and then the big gunfight breaks out, and he ducks behind uh, his garbage yeah. cans. And the reporters are asking, like, well, why didn't you join in? He's like, well, I spent eight years dodging bullets out in Germany. I was damned if I was going to get shot in Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> Um, have, you, 
if you guys, I don't know if everyone's had a chance to kind of read through the entire book, but um, uh, what, is, what are some, besides your, your own stories that you worked on, what are some stories that for you were kind of like, huh, that's, that's really cool, or you know, really jump that story? I decided I wanted to do it. 
I just got into it. But this was the one that kind of uh, honed it in and made, focused what I wanted to do. My concern as I was re as I was reading it was, you know, how are we going to tell this story visually? Uh, because it's not a very interesting visual story. I mean, it's a French architect quits, and this guy may or may not have remembered what he drew. I mean, there's it, it was hard to convey visually. So I remember when you uh, when you had sent me artist samples to talk about who I want to work with, I looked for someone that had a way of, that had a really fluid style that sort of made you know pedestrian scenes look interesting, and and that was with Kevin. I remember, I remember when we talked initially, there was, you know, I, I think we all probably maybe ran into this, like conflicting material. Yeah. So how did you handle that? There's a lot of, there's, uh, this, this whole urban legend thing of, of Banneker's involvement in recreating these, pl these plans that the French architect had walked out and had quit and they thought they could go ahead and just, you know, build it anyway based on what they had. And allegedly, Benjamin Banneker had a photographic memory and drew these plans out in a matter of a few hours. But there's there's really like almost a Republican Democrat debate over his involvement in that in that uh, in that design work. So it was interesting to read the proponents and the opponents, and that was fun. So I, I kind of presented it in a balanced way that showed both sides, but. Uh, the, the research I came up with leaned very heavily toward he had a, a very specific involvement in, in recreating his plans. But you know, this was a this was a man who was probably a was probably a genius anyway. You know, I was one of the things that the most fascinating thing I read was how he he taught himself astronomy, and I almost wanted to write about that, but that had nothing to do with Washington. But I, I had Kevin I, I put a panel in there where he was doing. it. Like he taught himself astronomy by taking pieces of glass and putting them up against the night sky and marking it with chalk and, and wax pencil over the course of like three years. Like that's, that's archaic, but I mean it would take such a it would take such a, a strong mind or a, a photographic memory to be able to teach yourself that from those bizarre you kind know, of ways of mapping the stars that to me it leaned toward that, that he could remember architectural plans. So I, I put that in there subtly to set up that this was a brilliant man besides the fact that he did this, that you know, he built a clock out of wood that worked. Like, you know, so a, friend, a, a wealthy friend has had a clock and he liked it and he borrowed it and for two days he took it apart, remembered what all the parts were, put it back together and then whittled one out of wood with like working parts. And the clock worked for 150 years after his death. That was a fascinating. He was a fascinating man. Well, it was interesting you said how, like, essentially you become like, like talking in your head. But you found a way to kind of convey some interesting things, like the angles and the maps. I remember you, you were sending me questions about this Northwest, this, how the streets go, do they to left, you know what I mean? I confused that? myself. <laughs> I confused myself with a map of Washington, D.C. because the way, uh, the way Banneker memorized the, the layouts was um, was north, south, east, west angles. And he remember angles and rebuild the streets. So as I was reading this, I got myself confused as to which way everything was in Washington. So there was a Friday afternoon where like Matt and I were back and forth. I'm like, so if this is north, this would be northwest. Because I couldn't figure it out myself. Well, I've driven there many times. I still can't figure it out. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I can't imagine trying to drive through there. It's, <laughs> it's a piece of cake. It's, it's immersion, man. You just jump in. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, I remember drawing that page. I was excited to do this big splash page where he's got like the whole map laid out, and it's basically like recreating this old vintage map drawing, and then all the bits of text he's sort of li listing off. You know, like taking off little different places. And I'm like, okay, now I need to find where these actually are, so I can like place them near where they are on the maps. Yeah. I think that's, that's one of the challenges when, when we actually do like historically based stories. It's like um, yeah. we want to make it as accurate as possible, but you don't. I don't think want to go over the minutia so much that it kind of like pulls you away from what the story is. You know. So I thought that was. Uh, I thought I would kind of pull that out. Yeah. But um, does anyone have any questions that they'd uh, like to ask us about the book? I do. I, uh, yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, I, I've got a couple. One of them comes from my 
real ignorance of this book. I have, I've heard about this book, literally haven't read anything other than, than this Facebook just an hour or so ago before this panel. I was like, I need to go to that. That sounds really interesting. Hearing, um, hearing you talk about the, uh, um, the fact that when you, when you were drawing the, uh, the assassination story, uh, the assassination attempt story, and the, the violence that you toned down, and I think what you said is because it's a kid's book. Well, it's not so much a kid's book. I, I think I've simplified it. Um, it's geared towards um, uh, more scholastic uh, things. And it's, I mean, it's a history book. And, yeah, so, um, which was my question, Put, putting it together. When we decided this is the kind of book we want to do, was was that that the goal you kind of wanted this to be? And I mean, not that you know we couldn't all read it and enjoy it and have a great time, but that you were aiming to like, put these audience. put these in you know put these in kids' hands. And, yeah, and, and, I didn't want to do anything that would prevent it to, from being put into kids' hands. It's right. more, more yeah, that, that was the purpose because um, uh, with with this particular publisher, a previous I had another anthology, Trickster. Native American tales that were told by Native Americans specifically for this book. And so I think the publisher had really success reaching a particular market with libraries and schools with that. So we were trying something a little bit different. You know, what kind of spawned this idea for me was I actually did an initial like main comic about a, a Victorian mansion in Washington that used to be owned by this brewmaster. And the museum is now, or the mansion is now a museum. And it's really a fascinating story. He's got like like a um, salamander on top of the, the terrace. Uh, so when you walk in, and he, was, he lived to be 102 years old. And, he, and so, uh, and he, um, he was around, like, his business was around the like, late 1800s through 1900, so he had to go through prohibition. Through prohibition, they were actually selling, um, I think, like, ice to the federal government. That's how he kept, uh, kept his business. He was selling ice and something else. I forgot what. Um, but uh, then, you know, prohibition was overturned, and he you know, started doing these types of arguments. So the idea was really to, like, we had such good success with that. I knew there were other, like, stories like this in Washington. And again, we're looking for stories that were, you know, had some historically significant, but also had that narrative component. And a lot of the more contemporary stories, whenever we could, we reached out to the people that they're about. Um, we, you know, we had a story about the, uh, the bugler at JFK's funeral. Right? And he, would, he botched one of the notes in the cats. So the woman who wrote that, her husband was in the, in the band that, when that happened. So he knew like the family. And so this woman reached out to the family and she was given access to the, because he got like, just thousands and thousands of letters from people. So she read over the, the letters that people sent to him. And you know, there's this question about whether it was whether he kind of intentionally did it or whether it was a mistake, you know, to kind of put like a little yeah. asterisk on it or something like that. And, you know, from what he said, it, it was not intentional. Um, but whenever we could, we did reach out. And I mentioned um, um, the story about um, uh, what's the name? Bailey, uh, the, uh, the, um, the CIA agent. You know, we talked to him. And, um, and he didn't live too far away from my house, so we, you know, I used to go over there and just kind of chat with him and stuff. And you know what was ironic about that whole thing? All those spy guys, uh, um, the, the handsome guy that got caught, and Bailey, and, um, there were a couple other guys uh, in the late 80s. They all lived like in the same rough neighborhood. <laughs> so I don't know if there the, was like, you know, intentionally they all kind of like tried to live near each other or whatever. The Soviet spy <laughs> district. <laughs> so but, like, I was like, that's really kind of weird stuff. Right. Yeah. No, so, uh, but again, I think he was really excited to, to do the comic because he was telling his story in a different way. And he was had a lot of that he was working on. And I think he was enjoying the book. I have a question. Like, how did this come together? Are there other projects for other cities? that are like this, or is this something that's been pretty unique, and are there going to be interested in doing other cities? Um, you know, I, I, I hope so. You know, I think one of the, like I said, one of the advantages we have was the fact that it's it's really a story about local people, but it's the nation's capital, so there's that interest. But, I mean, there, there could be, like, New York, it's kind of a new brand. They keep lots of books about New York. But, you know, there's some other cities that, you know, I think that it could, it could be, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, the reason I chose to work with folks that are in this book that either they live in D.C. 
or they have lived in DC, or they, they know it really well, like maybe they have some relatives. I think that was important because you have to, I think, visually like know where the monuments are. You know, you're the Washington Monument is not 20 feet from the White, from the White House, even though it might look that way. I was supposed to be in DC for the first time, I'm like, <laughs> right, and so like, yeah, we're trying to we're trying to be kind of truthful, and so I think you have to have people who kind of experience it. And like Jake said, he went, he rode in Rolling Thunder just to kind of feel what it's like. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it'd be great. Other folks can do it. You know, I think we're, we might be working on like on another project related to district commerce, but maybe in a different type of format. Because like, locally, we've had a lot of interest in it. You know, yeah. School teachers, and libraries, they say, hey, you know, we're going to do something else or. You know, why didn't you do this particular story? And that's another thing when you do anthologies, there's also people who come out with, you know, criticisms. I haven't heard anyone say, like, well, technically this story was, you know, off right or whatever. Right. But I had other people like, kind of say, like, well, what about all the different races in the city? You know, like, well, you know, that's part of the nature of the decent anthology. You try to, try to give people a little bit of flavor of what's in there. Hopefully, you know, this will inspire folks to kind of research the city or, or I think too, like the, the nation's capital kind of gets, you kind of forget that it's an actual metropolitan city. You know, people look at it and they just see like the capital building and all the, the government business that gets done there, but like it's, you know, it's a major metropolitan city. There's a lot of people living in the district that don't have anything to do with the government. I was at, uh, I was at a store in Baltimore doing a signing for these things. And the woman said, oh, that's a, that's a district college. And she said, oh. <laughs> and I, I think that reaction was more toward like the political squabbling that goes on in Washington, rather than you don't have to go too far out of the city, uh, out of the uh, the downtown proper area where the government buildings are to see like you know just what the city is really like, what the people are really like. Yeah. It reminds me of a, it's like Ian Mackay quote is talking about you know like DC is his city and it lives there and it's but you know and the public consciousness is just like the seat of the government but he was like you know for me it's just like the weather you know like, <laughs> all right the seasons are changing like somebody moves in they move out and somebody else you know. I worked uh, I worked for a publishing company uh, briefly like right around the corner from the White House uh, yeah, between the Bush administration and the Obama administration and it was weird to see Mafia Plaza like or Heartbreak yeah. from protesters to like, you know, picnics. <laughs> one, one more question. I just wondered, I know that um, Fulcrum's putting out colonial comics, and yeah. a lot of those stories are being written by historians. And what was the accountability on the writing team when it came to research? Did you just sort of, are you guys all like, you just write comics and you decide to tell these stories, or what, what did that look like? Oh, well, again, um, Sometimes we had, you know, it was a mishmash of different writers, people who were like, are experts in this field, or if they wanted to do a different thing, you know, do their own research. And, and I, I really made an effort to make sure people were kind of accountable doing the best possible research they could. You know, so um, people that were, you know, folks that were passionate about it, you know, like Chad did his kind of research. And, and there's some stories that we actually researched that we decided not to do because we couldn't, like, we felt uncomfortable with some facts in it. You know, we're going to do a, a story about a type of haunting. And we found out that you know there was no documentation. So, anyways, thanks everyone. Thanks for the panelists and for everyone. We're gonna have to wrap it up because the next panel is coming in. Thank you.